and welcome. During the Anti-Comics Crusade video, I intended to include reviews of comics specifically cited in Seduction of the Innocent. I thought it would be interesting to compare what was written about the comic with the actual content of the comic mentioned. What follows is a few reviews of notorious comics that were targeted by that book. One panel of this comic was famously used to illustrate what Seduction of the Innocent identified as the injury to eye motif. In fact, that panel was Dr. Wortham's Exhibit A during his testimony to the Senate subcommittee in 1954. While the panel looks rather ghastly, it's not an actual example of an eye being injured. Yeah, the woman is being threatened, but no actual injury occurs. Sure, this is splitting hairs, but a scholarly document, as seduction of the innocent purported to be, requires that level of minute scrutiny. Also, the context Dr. Wortham conveniently leaves out is that the woman pictured is having a nightmare. The woman in question is Mary Kennedy, and she's the star of the wonderful story titled Murder, Morphine, and Me. The story is written as if it's the true confession of a young woman who is seduced into a life of crime. That was a popular conceit of a fair amount of crime comics and pulp magazines from that era. Like most young ladies in crime comics, Mary is led astray by a charming man that turns out to be a hardened criminal. This man, Tony, specializes in peddling dope. But Mary doesn't realize he's a grifter at first, although she should have figured out something was unusual when Tony paid her to go out on dancing dates and entertain a series of strange men. When Mary finally confronts Tony about being lent out to every Tom, Dick, and Harry, he comes clean and admits he's a dope pusher. He also admits that all the men she entertained were selling drugs and she was their cover. So like it or not, Mary is now complicit in peddling junk. From there, things get even worse for Mary. Tony becomes paranoid and abusive. A war breaks out between competing gangs and Mary is caught in the middle of it all. The story doesn't end well for anyone involved. This is a surprisingly mature story that ends with a few interesting revelations. Sure, it's a bit crude around the edges, and there are a few pages that looked phoned in, but all things considered, it's a solid story with believable characters. Mary starts out as a sweet, naive young lady, and by the end of the story, she is transformed into a haggard, bitter woman who's seen and experienced way too much. It may be one of the best Golden Age crime stories I've run across. It's definitely on par, if not somewhat better, than what EC was doing at the time. The story was written and drawn by Jack Cole, who is probably best known for creating the bizarre superhero Plastic Man. Cole was an interesting creator, and somewhat a casualty of the public outrage over comics in the mid-1950s. To give this some context, Cole wrote and drew Plastic Man for years. When that character had run its course, he turned to creating more serious crime stories like Murder, Morphine, and Me. He also branched out and mixed crime and horror, most notably in the comic book Web of Evil. So, as a creator, he was definitely trying to push the constraints of the medium. When the Comics Code came into effect in late 1954, Cole's comic book output abruptly stopped. It didn't taper off. It, like, completely stopped. It's pretty easy to argue that the Comics Code restrictions made it impossible for Cole to produce material that would be creatively satisfying. So, to avoid the frustration of censorship, he simply walked away from the comic book field. From that point forward, he concentrated on producing gag cartoons for a variety of humor magazines. Eventually, he would exclusively draw cheesecake cartoons for the recently launched Playboy magazine. Unfortunately, the Jack Cole story has an unpleasant ending. For reasons that are mostly unclear, he took his own life in 1958. Now, it's probably inaccurate to suggest that the anti-comics movement had any influence on Cole's demise. But this crusade definitely ended the comic book career of someone who was beginning to experiment and to take the medium in a more serious direction. Reform School Girl tells the story of Faith Butler, a wayward girl who has fallen in love with the tough guy Jeff Nason. To impress Jeff, Faith steals a dress to make herself look like a slick chick. Jeff is suitably impressed. Since theft seems easy, Faith tries to steal some more items to get Jeff hot and bothered. Unfortunately, She's nabbed in the process and then sent to a reform school for girls. Nothing will keep Faith from her Jeff, though. She leaves the reform school and finds Jeff, but Jeff is preoccupied planning a caper with his boys, so he slaps her around until she leaves. Pissed off, Faith rats Jeff and his gang out to the cops. 
Shortly thereafter, Jeff apologizes to Faith, claiming he was only fronting. Pleased, Faith suggests they run away and get married. But Jeff has that caper to pull off first. As he leaves, Faith suddenly remembers she sold him out to the authorities. Faith rushes to the docks to warn Jeff, but the cops are already there. In the confusion, Faith gets shot. The story instantly skips ahead three years, with Faith being released from the reform school. She gets a job assembling thingamabobs at a nameless factory, where she once again runs into Jeff. Both have changed their evil, self-destructive ways, and their love, oh their love, has only gotten stronger. I need to mention that the only copy I could find of this comic was a black and white reprint done by Eclipse in 1989. Unfortunately, it only contained the main story, not the four color stories contained in the original comic, so I can only compare this one story to its description and seduction of the innocent. This one-shot comic was published by Realistic Comics, a publisher that only existed for two years between 1951 and 1953. They were less than prolific, only publishing 12 comics before disappearing into obscurity. It's possible this company would be completely forgotten if one of their titles wasn't mentioned in Seduction of the Innocent. Anyway, this story is a poorly written cautionary tale. It's barely coherent, and the main characters are as flat and as shallow as an average Kardashian. The sex in it is basically non-existent, but there are a lot of headlights to keep a young man's interest. So I suppose that counts as sex, I, I guess. There's literally no torture, and the violence is somewhat brutal, but completely sanitary. I mean, it's an example of a terrible, cheesy comic, but it barely resembles the inflammatory description it receives in Seduction of the Innocent. It's hard to believe this cheap, pulp comic would inspire anyone into a life of crime. If anything, its intent is to deter people from crime. I mean, in the final analysis, it's a love story for stupid people. That being said, it is kind of lovely in its own incompetent way. As a side note, the cover of this comic book, which I adore for its lovely, lurid cheesiness, was repurposed from a novel by Felice Suados. This novel, also called Reform School Girl, published in 1950, was actually a reissue of a novel from 1941 called House of Fury. Neither of these two works are remotely related to the 1950 movie of the same name. Apparently, the model on the cover is the Canadian skater-slash-model, Marty Collins. Allegedly, she was more than a little bit displeased, with her face being associated with the subject matter. But, despite my best efforts, I couldn't confirm any of that information. A cheap gangster named Skeeter decides to try his hand at bacterial warfare. To that end, he poses as an FBI agent, goes to an unspecified research division, and steals a sample of some unspecified bacterial agent. He then sends his gal pal, Liz, over to Africa to infect the tribe Rula, jungle goddess, protects. Yeah, flawless plan, right? Rula saves Liz from a leopard attack. This devious gal is then integrated into the tribe during the comic book version of a training montage. Yeah, that panel is not insinuating anything. Not anything at all. Liz then poisons the food supply of the tribe. This leads them to all get thinner and to eventually turn red at which point they fly into a murderous rage. Rula eventually discovers Liz's evil plan, which leads to both Liz and Skeeter meeting a suitably grisly death. Rula Jungle Goddess was yet another entry in the young women prancing around the African jungle genre. Honestly, I've never understood the appeal of this genre, or why it was a big trend during the 40s and 50s. I'm guessing it has everything to do with the bikini. Also, I don't think it's coincidental that Rula's appearance gives off a Betty Page vibe. Anyway, the objection to this comic, as stated in Seduction of the Innocent, seems to be around the implication that the United States government is engaging in secret biological research. And, you know, that is a fair assessment of the comic book. While not explicit, it does imply that the U.S. government is rather interested in this type of research. I would have to presume that suggesting the government is doing naughty stuff in secret was considered a form of propaganda at the time. With the Red Scare going on, I guess any implication that the government is anything but upstanding and righteous would be considered communist in origin. Otherwise, I'm not certain how a story like this qualifies as propaganda. In the end, I would suggest reading Murder, Morphine, and Me, if you can find it. In my opinion, it has all the plot beats of a reasonably good noir movie, compressed into a 14-page story.
as far as I can tell. It was only reprinted in Mr. Monster's True Crime No. 1 in 1993, and in the Mammoth Book of Best Crime Comics in 2008. For a story of its quality, it is surprisingly difficult to locate. At the same time, it's well worth the effort. That's it for today. Like, share, subscribe, and comment, and I will talk at you later. Until next time.